Hello, my name's Hedley Rees, and the presentation I'm going to give today is called Disrupting Big Pharma, Why Only Politicians Can Do It and How. Now, <clears throat> that might seem like a, a rather um, tough challenge, but it is possible. I'm hoping by the end of this uh, presentation, you're going to feel the same way. So just to say a brief bit about me first, <clears throat> just so that you are and understand um, that I'm, I'm actually worth listening to. So I'm a professional in production and industrial engineering. So production engineering is about producing things, making physical things, and industrial engineering is about improving those systems. And, and the two together form quite a powerful way of um, industrial change and in, in innovation. I joined Mars Laboratories uh, in 1980, uh, yeah, 1980, the start of the blockbuster era. Um, one of the products that Mars used to make is uh, Aquacelsa, which uh, some of you may 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 or might, may not know. Um, but the year before, Bayer uh, AG, Bayer AG had bought uh, Mars Laboratories basically to win back the aspirin roundel that had been confiscated during the war and th this was um, new to me when I got there but uh, I was glad to be part of a much bigger organization with all the skills and, and experience and the training that, that you get and um, I spent 16 years at Bayer and really learned uh, all about uh, manufacture, drug development, distribution, that whole thing and uh, I did an MBA at Cranfield in 1994-95. And uh, having done that, I, I left Bayer to join a company called British Biotech and as head of logistics. And then I spent nine years basically working in biotech. And biotech really is about what they call virtual supply chains, fully outsourced supply chains, where the company developing the drug does not actually own the whole, um, any of the supply chain that's all outsourced. And um, after that nine years, I had launched a drug in the US with Genentech called Tarceva. And uh, in 2005, after that, I founded PharmaFlow, which is the company I'm still running today. So in the abstract, I've, talked, I've spoken about a very pivotal event in the world of medicines, battle of the anti-cancer anti uh, cancer drugs. Um, so I'm going to go through that. Here in 1976, a company called Smith Klein and French um, developed a drug called Targamet, and that launches, as I say, in 1976. The international non proprietary name for that is Sametidine. In 1981, uh, five years later, Glaxo launched a competitive product called Zantac, uh, Ranitine. By 1987, Zantac was the world's uh, best-selling pres prescription drug, and it was actually selling, uh, outselling Targamet by three to one at one point. And this was the beginning of a lucrative strategy for, for the in in industry as they cast a, a new way of developing drugs based on the observations of this battle between Targamet and Zantac. So to say something about the, the new new strategy, both the drugs obviously were patented and it was um, clear to all that with a patent and an approval to sell, the potential was there to um, make mega profits. So you can see in the diagram there, you've got the patented molecule, then you've got the blue line is the time it takes to develop the product. Um, to prove it's safe, efficacious, and it's made to the right quality. And then you've got the approval to sell. And where Glaxo really shone, if I can use that word, was in exploiting the market. They they out says the marketed um, uh, 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 Smith & French very significantly. And basically they did that by targeting some side effects that the drug, that, that the Targamet drug had, so when they detailed doctors, they really convinced doctors that this was the the the, the drug to use. So um, that really sent a message to the industry. Basically, what 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 you need is a pigment molecule, and you need the sales and marketing muscle to be able to um, uh, differentiate the product with doctors. 
And we see here that 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 really established the initial phase of discovery, discovery of research, and sales and marketing as the two key elements in any strategy to bring a drug to market. Now, uh, I'm arguing here, and I've argued for many years, that pharma actually took a long, a wrong fork in the road when they followed this strategy. But this is what they did: they sold off um, the physical assets, including manufacturing facilities, distribution warehouses, um, quality control laboratories, and they were making people redundant through all this. So they were really um, culling the whole workforce. Uh, clinical trial uh, units went, and um, we know that even products that weren't making the product uh, that subsequently became generic uh, were, were, were dropped as well, even though patients had been taking them for maybe 10, 10 years, depending on them as, as loyal customers. So here we have a strategic um, culling of workforce and selling of facilities that took place maybe early 1980s, maybe not, not long after um, Zantac launched as the industry began to sort of think that patents were going to be their uh, route to riches. So the, uh, the, 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 the cull was executed or the, the trim back and the industry, the pharma companies, the big pharma companies basically decided that their core business was discovery research and sales and marketing. And what was non-core was anything to do with drug development. Now, I'll talk later about how essential it is to, to, to um, consider a drug like any other physical product, so that um, when you develop a, a, a drug, a car, an aircraft, aircraft, whatever, you have to go through set stages to be able to get to market. And the supply chain is a, an absolutely fundamental part of that. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, so I, I'm, I'm saying here now that the cull be, uh, begun and uh, there are masses of people left the industry. But what happened, of course, they, those people wanted jobs. They were highly skilled. The big pharma companies had outsourced the skills and the capability. And we then saw um, some of the senior executives who'd left, they formed small drug development companies which I'm calling SDDs, and in the, the books I write, I, 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 I use that term. And other senior executives formed contract uh, service organizations. So those organizations, their uh, role in life was going to be to offer the services that had been outsourced back to the companies developing drugs, the big pharma companies and the small drug developers. And, and we saw... Um, the emergence of contract development and manufacturing organizations, which are known as CDMOs, and contract research organizations, CROs. Now, those um, obviously were um, uh, uh, radical steps that were being taken. And Big Pharma basically sat back and watched and waited to see what happened in terms of their new strategy, which was to patent drugs and use sales and marketing to build up blockbusters. So in terms of uh, the top contract development and manufacturing organizations we've seen in recent years, here we have the top five. There is There, there are references in the end, and you'll be able to see the reference to where this came from. Uh, so first we see Lonza there, which is the... Um, largest CDMO in, in, in the world, based in Switzerland. Um, and if I can go into the press release here, Lonza and Moderna enter a new agreement to double drug substance production for COVID-19 vaccine in VISP. So we know that actually it wasn't Moderna that made the, uh, the, the vaccines or the injections at all, it was Lonza. Um, in fact, I would argue that Lonza probably is the only company in the world with the depth of experience to be able to make complex biologics, which these uh, which these vaccines which these vaccines are. Then we have the next largest uh, CDMO in the world, which is Catlin Pharma Solutions. And if I go into that, we will see that Catlin Pharma Solutions actually produced the the the, the fill vials for um, 
for uh, Moderna as well. So we we can see here, and this is a measure that that we'll we'll see more of, that many of these companies or, or none of the vaccine manufacturers actually produced the drugs that they said they were producing. So here we see the top five uh, CDMOs in the world. We have Lonza being number one, based in Switzerland. We know that Lonza um, manufactured the Moderna mRNA vaccine uh, or injection. We know that because there's um, a, a press release that's uh, that, that's available that actually states that. And we know that the second largest CDMO in the world, Catlin Pharma Solutions, produced um, uh, Moderna's uh, drug product. That's the the vials uh, filled with uh, the mRNA liquid substance. So you can see they are substantial companies. They turn overs in the billions. And what's happened over the years is that the CDMOs and the CROs have grown like topsy through consolidation where they now are significant organizations themselves. So um, we can look at the third, fourth, and fifth largest C CDMOs in, 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 in the world and just register that um, all the skills and all the experience, the regulatory experience sits with these companies following the outsourcing that I, I, I spoke about. Then we look at the top five CROs. We've got Thermo, Thermo Fisher actually has bought a, a, some CDMOs, um, uh, um, uh, Patheon and one or two others, and they've got C CROs. So the, 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 the revenue figures are probably um, containing both of them. So we'd have to estimate, but there are significant turnovers in both uh, for Thermo Fisher in both CDMOs and, and CROs, and it is the largest CRO in, in, in the world. Ituvia is the second largest, uh, Lab, LabCorp drug development, Icon, and again, we know Icon outsourced its, some of its work to Ventavia, where Brooke Jackson, the whistleblower, worked and discovered almost within days of being there that there were horrendous things going on in terms of good clinical practice. And um, I've interviewed Brooke a number of times. She's a brilliant lady. She's doing brilliant work. And it's it's just amazing to think that she is having to fight so hard to get to, 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 to get justice. So then we have Paracel, which is the fifth uh, largest CRO in the world. So I hope you're getting the message here. The big pharma companies they didn't develop the um, the SARS-CoV-2 injections for um, Moderna. We know it was Lonza and and Catlin Pharma Solutions. We know for AstraZeneca it was Oxford Biomedica uh, who made the drug substance, the adenovirus drug substance, not AstraZeneca and certainly not Oxford University. Um, and we know uh, for Pfizer. We have to read between the lines uh, somewhat. I'll say more on that later. But I, 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 I'm convinced that Lonza and Rentschler and these other Rentschler is a contractor that Pfizer used. I'm convinced that Lonza has a very significant presence in in all of that, and I'll explain later how I think that could be tested. So when was a a, a whiff from trouble ahead? So. Um, the big pharma companies have outsourced all their physical capability to develop drugs. And then in uh, 2006, the U.S. Government Accountability Office published th this report, New Drug Development. Uh, and it, it goes through the issues that they found when they looked at uh, the, 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 the new drugs coming to market. Uh, Again, there's a link to um, the report in the uh, in the final slide, and they discovered that in terms of failure rates of drug development, for every ten thousand screen molecules with a patent behind them, only two hundred and fifty of those go into preclinical research. So all that molecular modeling and that goes to nothing. 
when you come to preclinical testing, the, 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 the drugs that go into preclinical testing, development candidates, these have to have a significant amount of work carried out on them and a significant number of animals are used during the, the preclinical testing. And for all the testing and the money spent, only five actually get into the clinic to be tested on humans. So 245, all that money is wasted, is on the cutting room floor. It's a sinful waste of money, but it's happening. Of the five that enter clinical trials, four of them fail. And in fact, there's evidence from Tufts University that says it's it, it's a bit worse than that now. So, um, and only one gets approved. So only one out of 250 development candidates get to market. So you, you imagine why it appears to be so, uh, so costly to develop a drug. Most of it is the cost of failure. And in terms of time to market, and this is very relevant uh, when we talk about SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID-2 timelines and, and uh, development program, this is, you know, this is actual um, evidence from this report. The preclinical um, work takes three years. Clinical uh, studies take seven years. And FDA uh, approval takes 1.5 years. So... In total, it takes 11.5 years for a, 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 a typical drug to get to market. And that report was done based very much before biologics had started to come along. Biologics get much more difficult to manufacture. They've got very specific issues in terms of temperature, being able to prove that the temperature excursions haven't taken place. There are huge issues with developing um, biologics. So you would expect for the biologic, which the um, which the SARS-CoV-2 injections are, would take longer uh, than 11.5 years. So to say a drug was developed uh, like these, was developed in uh, nine months, is, is complete nonsense. It's, it's lunacy. And it can be proven very easily. I've actually submitted an expert witness statement to uh, the Mississippi public health team that are calling for um, a grand jury inquiry and it proved beyond all doubt that nine, nine months is absolutely impossible and explains it in, in significant detail. So here there's a whiff of trouble ahead, as you might imagine. And the industry thought, well, um, we're not getting anywhere really with the standard indication, the standard diseases like Alzheimer's, like heart indications or whatever. So then they looked at the less challenging regulatory environments uh, where the patient populations were, you know, more desperate, if you like, in inverted commas, um, rare diseases, often indications, and all things cancer. The problem was, of course, that um, you had to charge exorbitant prices because those are very sort of small population of patients. So the industry then started to use health economics and outcomes research um, uh, to to um, create market access plans to put to governments and other uh, buyers to justify the high prices to say, you know, although this is $400,000, um, you're going to save this much in terms of hospital costs and, you know, the lifetime of a imagine a patient. Um, you know, and those, um, those cases very often... Uh, are difficult to, to 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 understand if they are actually accurate or or, or not. And then, in uh, we saw gene therapy in two thousand and seventeen, Novartis's drug Kimria. Kimria was approved in the U.S. Uh, launch price was four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. This is for uh, what they call a, a CAR T indication, a, a blood cancer, and. Really, that was the great white hope of the um, the industry, gene therapy being the next new bastion uh, for the industry. Uh, and actually, they haven't delivered on their promise. Um, many have been, uh, one Glybera was, was just before uh, Kimria was a million pounds a dose. So hospitals ha are having to pay add-on costs on top of that. So the gene therapies, that we've seen coming through, they haven't gone anywhere either. 
And I know from personal experience that Oxford Biomedica in the UK manufactures the Camarilla Varo Vector, the Lenti Varo Vector. A, a Varo Vector is what delivers the modified cell back into a patient's body to help uh, rectify the, the, the disease. A virus, when it enters your body, it replicates its own DNA, and that's what makes you ill. So if you can change the virus DNA, when it goes into the body, it replicates the modified DNA that you want the patient to, to receive. That's the theory behind this. And and, and that's how it um, is supposed to work. But, you know, it's um, the manufacturing is and the logistics issue are, are, are severe. And to date, they haven't actually been been solved. I just saw today that um, the um, new CEO of, uh, of Oxford Biomedica was at Rensselaer by a farmer from 2016, which we know uh, produced uh, the Pfizer, was one of the companies that produced the Pfizer drug substance, the plot thickens. <clears throat> so what I'm saying here is, this is my supposition. I could be wrong. And um, from my personal experience, uh, I don't believe I am. Uh, and there is a way to to be sure. But what I'm what I'm suggesting is that as we've heard, less and less drugs going to market, gene therapies failing to gain the traction they, they were supposed to uh, boast to have. Investors, obviously in pharma, being used to blockbuster profits, are wondering, you know, where's our next blockbuster coming from? They don't seem to be appearing. And the the issue for the whole industry is that now the contractors hold the cards in terms of being able to develop the drugs and commercialize them and um, the distributing the distribution network holds the cards in terms of selling into the hospitals and, and, and pharmacies. So um, but they do need the big pharma profits to be able to keep their investors happy as well because if big pharma don't make don't make the the profits, all the companies that Big Pharma now is buying services from, they, they, they are not going to get their, their profits. So there's a sort of mutual dependency between the two. And what potentially might have happened, could have happened, I think happened, was they've done a deal with the devil to conspire together to hollow out the regulatory agencies uh, which then would allow them to um, ignore the the, the, the time-honoured practices uh, from FDA and European Medicines Agency. And I'm thinking back now to the days of, you know, pr prior to any of this, um, the, the late 90s, um, the, the days when Jack Janet Woodcock joined the FDA and, and, and you know, started to work on modernisation. The industry has just ignored that and... To me, we need to really establish by way of inspections of all these facilities that have made the drug substance and drug products. We know FDA has have been into Rensselaer, who made the Pfizer drug substance, and that was a horrible, horrible result. The when when FDA inspect, they issue what they call a, an FDA four eight three, which is a, a a report, and that report is publicly available. They've also been into the Catlin Pharmaceuticals uh, Pharma Solutions Bloomington site. And again, that was a very, very um, concerning inspection result. Um, and I would say the plan should have been stopped for remediation work immediately, and there would have been significant remediation work involved. But uh, other, uh, other sites that we know about, Lonza, Oxford Biomedica, other contractors who have been heavily involved in making these vaccines should also be inspected. If they aren't, then you have to question why. And I want to follow up here now. I've 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 put the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation question mark, and uh, two observations here. Um, we see on the left hand side Trevor Trevor Mandel was president of Global Health uh, for um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, formerly Global Head of Development with Novartis. Um, he joined uh, BM, uh, 
DF in 2011, so he's been there a long time laying the groundwork. And just below his uh, his picture there, we've we've got a comment basically where he's talking about the SARS and MERS um, uh, uh, pandemics, pandemics, call it what you will, and saying that COVID-19 is particularly worry, uh, worrisome and claiming it's highly transmissible. Now, um, we have to question that. So that's one one thing that we should look about, look at, and and, and think about was that the influence from Bill and Amanda Gates there. The other thing is Ian Hudson, who who joined um who joined the, the Bill and Amanda Gates in two thousand and nineteen, albeit he set up a duplicate regulatory body in two thousand and sixteen called the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities. Now. Members of that is are all the country regulatory bodies just about in the world. They're all signed up to it. Ian Hudson was the first chair. The second chair was the CEO of European Medicines Agency, uh, maybe not CEO or head of or, or whatever. And the chair currently is Emma Cook, who is also um, head of the European Medicines Agency. So, uh, executive director may be the term. So, we have to question whether there's some sort of uh, conflict there between this duplicate body that hasn't been elected, um, and really doesn't uh, doesn't have um, a legitimate claim over any any sort of approval or evaluation of medicines, and. Uh, as I've dug into this, um, there seems to be have been an awful lot going on over uh, behind the scenes. Um, I should say here, I do write a substack called Inside Pharma, in which all this is, um, there's 14 months of various posts on all of this from um, from this the, the, the start, basically. It's... Um, it's, it's basically an evidence base of all, all these various things that, that have been going on. And there is a link to that in the um, in the uh, last slide at the end. So basically, the industry shot itself in the foot or big pharma companies shot itself in the foot by outsourcing all of its um, all of its physical critical assets and um, I'm a big, uh, a big admirer of Professor Andrew, uh, Andrew Cox, who, um, who probably is the world's greatest expert in um, in uh, outsourcing and uh, the the whole um, s supply management process. And um, uh, Andrew contributed to my book, um, I Find It, File It, Flog It. And he basically talks about outsourcing, and uh, he basically calls it a make-buy decision. You decide what you want to make and hold in-house yourself, and then the rest you might outsource, but you always have to keep control of the development and the manufacturing intellectual property in-house, otherwise you lose control. And th this is what's happened with Big Pharma, They've just over over egged the outsourcing. It happened with Boeing uh, for a short period with the Dreamliner. They tried to outsource their development, and they had huge delays in in the program and huge cost overspends, and eventually had to bring the, a lot of the work that they've outsourced back in house, and that managed to um, to. Um, uh, stop the damage, but unfortunately, the, the damage with, with Big Farm has, has been done, and so we, we're left in a position now where Big Farm has nothing, nowhere else to go. And in this next piece, I, I just want to explain to you what the real truth was behind this illusion that patented drugs and sales and marketing was the way to go. So, here we see Sir James Black. The submitted in program was a 12 years model of drug development 
So James Black was a physician and a pharmacologist. And um, as I say, he um, he was head of the program for Tagamet. And at the end of it, the American uh, Chemistry Society basically said that this was a model of collaboration between the UK and the US in bringing a drug to market using best practices. <clears throat> So uh, again, there's um, a, a reference to Sir James Black's uh, uh, career there, and he did win a Nobel Prize. And then more truth behind the illusion, we have Sir David Jack there, who was the head of the Renitidin program. And I've just added a note that people might point it out subsequently, they've been issued found with Zantec and it's been withdrawn from the market. Um, but this is what Sir David, Sir David Jack said, and uh, I'll let you read that, but he basically said that they took the notion that a drug with a cleaner process would potentially have less side effects, and they used that to um, deter the doctors and create this differentiation between Targamet and, 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 and Zantac. So, this was a five-year development program, not a 12-year development program. Uh, and basically, it was around, as I say, having a cleaner process. We started off with um, doctors, physicians being uh, pivotal to drug development, being at center of, of drug development. So James Black was a physician. Um, Banting and his colleagues who invented insulin, they were physicians. Um, Jonas Salk, uh, the polio vaccine, he was medically qualified. Over 40 years, we see purely scientists, molecular modeling, uh, doing all sorts of modeling work when they aren't actually close at all to patients, to um, the nuts and bolts of healthcare systems, they are fundamentally, and they have scientists have taken over the whole of drug development, and science has become the only thing that's important. And, you know, certain individuals in the sort of Fauci and the whole, this whole, um, this whole impression that if you're not a scientist, then you can't develop a drug and what you're saying doesn't make any sense. I'm not a scientist, but I'm extremely knowledgeable in the process of developing drugs and bringing them to market. And it's not about science only. Science has an initial um, involvement, but also there's an awful lot of other work that goes into it. And I often use penicillin as uh, as an example, here we have Sir Ian Fleming in his little um, machine here that he's going back to 1928, August 1928, where he comes back from holiday. And in one of his culture dishes, he sees that the mold is uh, as formed or the mold he's left is killing bacteria. Now, what most people think then is that Fleming brought um, penicillin to market, but actually he was a physician as well, and he didn't have the skill set to be able to isolate the active ingredient. It took him 10 years, over 10 years, to hook up with Oxford University and the, 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 the analytical chemistry group there. And a guy named Howard Flory uh, actually isolated the, the active ingredient. And it was only then that we were able to make small quantities of drug to be able to test in animals. And they... Uh, proved successful, so more evidence that penicillin was working, and they made small quantities again to test in some small number of uh, of of of, um, of patients, and again it began to work, and now they had a significant amount of evidence that penicillin was actually a huge potential product. But they couldn't make it in any quantity. They couldn't work out how to manufacture large quantities. So Flory and um, some two others flew off to the US to speak to the US Department of uh, Agriculture, which is the forerunner to the FDA. 
And they spoke to spoke to a few people there, one of them being uh, Andrew J. Moyer, who was an expert in the manufacture of um, molds. And uh, molds, you know, molds and uh, the sort of sensitivity of molds to what they eat and what they feed on, he, he uh, devised a process using corn syrup, liquor and lactose and... Um, I, I, I'm not a scientist, so I couldn't tell you exactly what it was, but it increased the yield of the process exponentially, and that process actually was uh, was patented. It was given to some of the large pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, Merck, uh, some of the others, to to use the process to manufacture ten quantities for World War Two needs, and. Uh, Moyer applied for the patent in 1945, and he was uh, uh, awarded it in 1948, and he was inducted into the U.S. Hall of Fame. So th that actually says that, you know, it tells me that if Fleming, a physician, uh, Oxford University, uh, uh, analytical chemist, and with the ability to isolate uh, active ingredients, and uh, Moya with the uh, skill sets to manufacture at large scale, they could have brought penicillin to market in five years if they'd been together, working together from that initial discovery by Fleming. In fact, it took around 15 years because we've got this um, focus purely on the first stage of development of a drug. So that's why I talk about taking medicines back to the future. And in many ways, there's a very simple explanation to counter what's happened with SARS-CoV-2, which is bring physicians, doctors back into center of drug development, but working with uh, the other skill sets that we need at the beginning. And there is a way to do that, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, for now, I just want to uh, introduce this. Th th this is my tongue-in-cheek description of the blockbuster strategy, the new strategy that um, that the the, the 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 sort of blockbuster era come up with. I call it "find it, file it, flog it." So we see the scientist here, he's been molecular, he's got his test tube, he's been modeling molecular, and he's got this little bit in this tech tube, he says, oh, Eureka, he phones his boss, and his boss says, is it safe? He says, it seems to be. Says His boss says, is it active? Seems to be. He's excited now, so he says, get into the clinic fa fast, we've got to get the clinical data to prove that it works so that we, we've got another blockbuster. <clears throat> Let's make some Fatox studies. So now we haven't made any. We've just got this little piece in a, in a test tube, and we think we've got a blockbuster. Enter the patent fair. We go to make some for toxicology testing, and the scientist hands his little baby over to um, to the lady who's going to make the first batch for the preclinical testing. And there she is making a little batch. And here we have the patent fairy thinking, I hope she's realizing I'd be watching her because from this point on, the patent, the, the clock has been ticking on the patent. You can see it here. I've taken this from the report I mentioned earlier, the US Accountability Office report. So uh, t t a patent is, is 20 years. So those drugs that have been patented, the clock is ticking from the day the patent is awarded. So here we have the patent gun going off. And then that patent starting pi uh, pistol initiates a rush to get into the clinic to get data to support a license application, a new drug application or biological license application or marketing authorization. And I'm saying that that's a bad idea because what happens at the beginning is foundational. And once you start to rush the preclinic or any part of it, you're going to find yourself in trouble. And, and that's what the industry has found. And this is why we have such high failure rates 
is because big pharma companies don't spend as little time as possible actually assessing the compound that they've got. And um, and that's a bad thing. And the various levels of failure and all these, these things that I've gone through are basically down to rushing products to market. And SARS-CoV-2 injections are the ultimate in rushing products to market. And we need, I'm, I'm basically saying we need to understand the impact of that. And I know in my subs, uh, in, in my abstract, I spoke about Russell Aycock, who's a very famous uh, US systems thinker. I'm a great admirer of, of him. Uh, he's written this book here, uh, The Art of Problem Solving, accompanied by Aikoffs and Fabers. And he's got so many interesting, telling um, anecdotes about what we all know to be true in business and in organizations, but people don't talk about. But what one of his sayings is, don't fight the system, change the rules, and the system will change itself. And... What that means is that, and again, I've written about this in, in various books, is that for any system, people understand the rules and they work to the rules to be able to deliver benefits for them. And the rules in uh, the, the, the rule in, uh, in patent law in, US, in, U, in global patent law is that there's such a thing called compound claims where you can claim a molecule that belongs to you and no one else can have access to it. And the industry over 40 years has been using compound claims instead of patenting the process as happened with Tagamet and Zantac and all the, the, the compounds on all the drugs before that, they started to patent the molecules and then claim the molecules as their own using this compound claims. And why I say it's um, it's it's archaic is because it doesn't make any sense because in any other sector, if you said I've got a molecule, say, to make a rubber tire that would make a car hold the road better, and you went to the patent office and they say, well, prove to us how that's going to help make the car hold the road better, better. and you wouldn't be able to, you'd be kicked out. But actually, in, in pharmaceuticals, you can say, look, I, this is my molecule. I can make a drug for Alzheimer's with this. And they say, OK, there's a patent. Uh, OK, if you've got the money to buy it, to pay for it, then you've got one. And it, it makes no sense whatsoever. So that has to change if we go into make anything uh, better, make things better. And this is where the politicians come in. First thing we have to understand that medicine is no less of a de development challenge than an aircraft, a, a submarine, anything physical that has to get to market. It has to go through development stages involving prototyping to make sure that you've, you've got all the right things in place. Then you have to go out and uh, and, and and do the development of the, of the product that you want to bring to market. And you've got to go through the various stages of development and all the various activities that need to go on. So when you think, ah, this market was developed, this project was developed and brought to market in huge quantities in nine months, then you have to you have to say, <laughs> I'm sorry. What we actually do is award a patent for the few grams of compound a theory. And with Alzheimer's, the theory has been that a substance either called uh, amyloid beta or tau wraps itself around brain fibers and causes the Alzheimer's condition. And the compounds to cure that have been a chemical structure that would dis dissolve those, the, the, those um, proteins. And actually, there have been over 30 late stage failures in the Alzheimer's for those compounds in the last 15 years. So obviously, this theory does not make a whole lot of sense. That's how we have these issues that we have today, that we are allowing pharmaceutical companies to develop drugs with no hope of ever getting to market. And as I said, it's the arcade compound claims that must change. 
So I've I've written a white paper called Medicines for the 21st Century, Safe, Better, Cheaper. Dr. Janet Woodcock kindly did um, the um, keynote address, recorded the keynote address. And I also have that, um, which I, I can share with people. And I must say that I have a lot of respect for Dr. Janet Woodcock because she's been pushing modernization since the late 1980s and done a lot of work on that. And the the pharmaceutical companies that just have not wanted to um go to the go to the lake and drink the water. They've just wanted to do their own thing. And um we all have to say that regulators have let us down through SARS CoV-2 and um we need to understand how that's happened. We know it's happened. And once we understand it's happened, how it's happened, we can start uh, remediation. So so, so that conference uh, I held, the white paper was after the conference. I also have a, a copy of that and my intent, and I'm, I'm working with people at the moment to convert that into further education of, so that people can actually return to a more uh, physician-centered way to bring um, innovative drugs to market. So um, that's it from me. I hope that uh, made sense. And I've got links in here that you can um, look at, at at your own leisure. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. And uh, you stay safe. Bye.